Hey everyone, Mike here. What you're about to watch is a clip from the DevOps Lounge stream. If you'd like to join us, then head on over to chat.learndevops.com.au. See you there. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are. Live again, DevOps Lounge stream. Thanks for showing up, October 6th. So on today's stream, I'm gonna be doing something a little bit differently. So on Sunday, what I what I did was I went over some cloud news stuff. So I went over cloud news like AWS, Azure, GCP, and then I went over some cybersecurity news, and then I went over, what else did I go over? And then I went over some articles that I found. But instead on in this stream, I'm actually gonna change things up a little bit. I'm gonna go over and, and go, with, go through with you uh, as I work my way through developing my DevOps roadmap which is essentially like the roadmap at roadmap.sh slash DevOps. But I'm going to be designing a more streamlined version of that roadmap so that it's essentially less less confusing, less choice, less less options, which doesn't sound good, but it's going to be good because it basically means that you're not going to have to kind of look at a really, really complex roadmap and sort of think, where do I begin? But there's still actually quite a lot going on there. So yeah, we're going to be looking at that today. We've got YouTube live up and running now. We've got it on Discord over here. Let's see what we've got. We've got Stubborn, we've got Link, we've got Bont. Welcome, Alex W. I dragged him in from the casual channel. He's probably not. I don't think he's even probably there. And then Adrian, welcome everyone. Thanks for showing up. Do appreciate it. Does anyone have any questions before I start? Or should I just get straight in? So anything that you want to talk about because ultimately i do these streams so that i can answer your questions so if you let me know what it is you want to see then i can create content for you but if not that's fine too. that's fine too link is typing hey adrian welcome back let's see what link's got to say while link types i'll take you over to the browser so this is what I'm currently work on, working on at the moment. So this is Miro. It's basically like a big infinity board. A little now, loud noise coming from outside. So this is Miro. Yeah, it's like a big whiteboard, essentially, like an infinity whiteboard. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to shrink me down a little bit. Boo! Got downgraded there. So this is the... I've not finished this yet. It's something I've been working on and recently... I decided that I think it's really, really important that I actually get this done. So if we look at the traditional DevOps roadmap, we bring this sort of over here and we look at the traditional one. I think this is a really, really, really excellent resource. I think it's a great way of potentially getting started. But what I don't like about it is that there's actually still quite a lot going on here. So you've got learner programming language. I don't actually, I don't actually agree with that as the as the first thing you should do. Personally, myself, you've got understanding different OS concepts. I think that's the first thing you should do, and then you've got to learn about managing servers, and then you've got operating systems. Learn to live in the terminal. And I think this is very well intentioned, and I think it's probably about the best you're going to get at the moment. However, I think it could definitely be better. So I'll give you an example of what I, what I don't like here is you've got learn a program and language, and then you've got all these languages listed. And then you kind of go, well, what should I, what should I pick? Now they've done this personal recommendation opinion here at the top. You can, you can see this sort of up here at the top, this highlighted section there. However, they haven't really, they haven't really They've sort of wound it down a little bit for you by saying, well, here's our, here's our personal opinion, which then boils down to over here, to, boils down to being go over on this point here. Is that easy to see? Should I make that maybe bright red? Is that easier to see? Should I make these red or that's probably easier to see, isn't it? Maybe. So you've got, they've, they've selected go over here. They've selected for, for startup management, they've got, sort of like personal recommendation, learn in a D. So they've got to understand different OS concepts and then they just select everything. Sort of like, it sort of, sort of makes sense. It's not really a personal opinion. You sort of do need to learn all those things, but it's still confusing in my opinion. So for example, learn operating system, they've recommended Linux. Yep, yeah, I agree. 
and then they recommend Ubuntu, CentOS, and RHEL. You're going to see those three Linux distributions in the wild the most, definitely, for sure, without a doubt. And then they've got Unix, and then they've got FreeBSD. And if you're going to select Unix, then FreeBSD is definitely the one to select. What I would say, though, is that you're not really going to see Unix out there all that often, um, to be perfectly honest with you. It's just, it is out there, don't get me wrong, like Netflix use FreeBSD on the CDN. They have FreeBSD right across the board there, but I don't think they use FreeBSD when it comes to the actual services themselves, the actual, the actual dynamic application that tries to compute compute things for you and tries to give you um, the feedback, like the search results that you want and stuff like that. I don't think that's based on FreeBSD, but I don't know. So it is out there. It's definitely out there. It's just not really that common, in my opinion. And then as you go down, the sort of the blue tick sort of loses its meaning. Networking, security, and protocol. So learn all of these, but maybe don't have to really learn email and DMARC and sort of like, yeah, it's kind of true, I guess. But I don't know. I just I just think the roadmap is still a little a little bit confusing and a little bit messy. What what do you guys think? Let me know in the chat there, or if you're on YouTube live, then let me know in the super chat, or if you're watching this on YouTube after after the fact, let me know in the comments whether you think that you know this sort of like nails it. For me, I just feel as though it's maybe just a little bit convoluted. Let's see what Link's saying in the chat here. Just saw Jag pop in. Welcome, Jag. Do you think any improvement in DevOps or similar processes could have stopped something like the BGP route deletion by Facebook from accidentally occurring? I I actually haven't. I, I am aware that Facebook went down, and, and I'm aware that it went down due to a BGP failure. But I haven't looked into what was the cause of the BGP failure. If I, I mean, look, I'm gonna take a bit of a guess, and I'm gonna hope that uh, Facebook probably has pretty good continuous integration and continuous delivery given the sheer scale that they operate at they, they sort of need it really but i don't actually i don't actually know what the the reason was for for the failure so i can't i can't comment as to whether better practices i what i can say is devops practices are, are definitely always going to lead to to more to better improvements if i go to nightbridge if i go to devops Nightmare. I think it was Night Capital, I think it was. If I can type. Let me find this story for you. There you go. This uh, so this is the story that that we should be focusing on in this regard, Link. This is the one that's definitely going to tell us whether or not let me just move this browser window over, over like that. This is the one that's gonna highlight the ab absolute definite need for DevOps. And this is regarding a software deployment that went wrong. And within 45 minutes, they lost $400 million in 45 minutes, $400 million in assets went bankrupt 45 minutes because of a failed deployment. So Knight Capital Group is an American global finance services firm engaged in market making electronic execution and institutional sales and trading. In 2012, Knight was the largest trade in US, blah, 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 blah. Let's have a look. So 3.3 billion trades daily, tra trading over $21 billion daily. That's mental money. That's no joke. No joke at all. Not at all. That's, that's serious money. On July 31st, 2012, Knight had approximately 365 million in cash and equivalents. So they go through here, they talk a little bit more. So what so what went wrong? So between July 27, 2012, July 31st, 2012, Knight manually, there's the keyword there, manually, this, this is the problem straight away. Knight manually deployed the new software to a limited number of servers per day, eight servers in all. This is what the SEC filing, the um, Securities Something Commission, says about the manual deployment process by the way if there's an se filing about your deployment something may have gone terribly wrong yeah if the sec get involved in anything like this you know you've gone really 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 badly wrong so uh during the deployment of the new code however one of knight's technicians did not copy the new code to one of the eight smars deploy uh computer servers Knight did not have a second technician review this deployment and no one at night realized that the power peg code had not been removed from the eighth server, nor the new uh, RLP code added. Knight had no written procedures that required such a review. It's also worth pointing out that there are no legal requirements that I'm aware of. I mean, it might be very different in finance. It might be very different in the US, but there are no real laws that say you've got to deploy in a particular way, or you've got to use ITIL, or you've got to have standard operational practices. You've got to have CI. We are in a very, 
very, very uh, security and exchange commission. That's it. Thanks. We are in a very de. We are on a very unregulated marketplace. Really, really. I mean, there's no chartership. There's none of that, right? You can just sort of wing it, sort of just get on with it. It's only when you lose data that people like the the SEC come into play. So, yeah, look, they didn't have any written procedures, and there's no requirement for them to, and that's why it's very dangerous, and that's why DevOps is very powerful. powerful. So to continue, at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time on August 1st, 2012, the markets opened, and Knight began processing orders from broker dealers on behalf of their customers for the new retail liquidity program. The seven servers, keep in mind there's eight, that had the correct SMARS deployments began processing these orders correctly. Order sent to the ACE server triggered the supposable repurposed flag and brought and brought back from the dead the old power pet code. So let's see what happened. It's important to understand what the dead power pet code was meant to do. This functionality was meant to count the shares bought slash sold against the parent order as a child orders were executed. Powerpeg would instruct the system to stop rounding child orders once the parent order was fulfilled. Basically, Powerpeg would keep track of the child orders and stop them once the parent order was completed. 2005 night moved uh, this unit, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So when Powerpeg flag on the eighth server was activated, the Powerpeg functionality began routing child orders for execution, but wasn't tracking the amount of shares against the parent order, somewhat like an endless loop. So for 45 minutes of hell. So long story short, because I want to get back to the roadmap. This answers your question very point, very pretty much perfectly linked because for 45 minutes straight, no one really knew what was going on. The the one server out of out of eight was essentially breaking stuff. They lost four hundred million dollars. And at the end of the day, all it really would have taken was taking the time to build some either even if you didn't want to automate it, even just doing standard operation procedures and having two things a list of steps that you run through and a code review uh, or, or not even a code review in this case, a deployment review. If you'd had two of those things, all of that could have been avoided. Half a billion dollars gone because they couldn't be bothered writing something down and they couldn't be bothered getting another engineer to check it. So that's that's why um, DevOps is super important. Whether this DevOps could have CICD or et cetera could have helped with the BGP issue at Facebook. I don't know because I don't really know much about that issue. If anyone wants to enlighten me, that is fine. I know there's plenty of coverage of it online. However, I haven't gone through the motions of uh, reviewing it at this point in time. We've covered it on the stream before, but I also was already familiar with the, with the formal verification community. Yeah, so I can't, I like, I can't really speak to the BGP stuff. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, I'm not sure why a DevOps engineer who isn't also a software developer would need to know C++, to be honest. Right. Oh, so now you're going back to the roadmap. So I hope that answers that question. I know we've covered it on the stream in the past, but there's a few new faces, I think. Uh, Confuse has joined us. Welcome. Matt James is returning. We've got Meg back. We've got Oscar. Excellent. Awesome. So if we go back to the roadmap... Yeah, you are you are correct. I mean, looking at the language selection, C and C++ are sort of in there, even even Rust. But for example, the default option of Go does not really resonate with me at all. I don't I don't agree with that at all. I don't think that that makes sense from my perspective. Go is I love Go. It's my favorite language. I write in Go all the time. I think it's fantastic. But this. Python is the option is the option really. What I would say is if you're in if you're starting your career and you have a few and you have a few basic concepts sort of understood and known, then it can be very, very important to ensure that you're picking stuff that you're gonna see the most in the wild. You're not gonna see go all that much in the wild outside of a software development company that's that writes stuff in Go. You're just not gonna see it. If you're going into the most enterprises, most governments, most organizations, you're going to see Python. You're going to see Python everywhere. So my recommendation, it would be to learn Python. So overall, this is why I'm just sort of a bit sort of disenchanted with the, with this roadmap. I think it's a great idea and I think it's off to a great start. I just don't think it was, I think it was executed in sort of like, there's just too much choice. And I don't, and I think in some cases, it's sometimes important to just simply not have choice. That's okay. It's okay to teach people fundamentals and not give them choice because sometimes choice actually causes more confusion than it actually does 
uh, solve anything. They're just random languages that don't really line up with the use case or domain of DevOps, in my own opinion. That's from Link. I agree, Link. Yeah, I don't, don't think it lines up very well at all. Matt James says, Python gets used lots for Lambda functions, managing AWS, etc. Devs agree with Python over Go. I, yeah, absolutely, Matt. Uh, I'm currently working on Python code at the moment. And indeed, uh, I was working with Lambda functions over the last few days, and they were written in Python. Yeah, absolutely. So what I want to do with my roadmap, um, I can see a few people type in, please continue, please keep asking questions. Um, if I move on from topic, I will come back, don't worry. So with regards to the roadmap that I'm breaking down at the moment, I want to sort of lock it down to a few core core things, and I want it to start with operating system. So here's my take on that. When you turn on your computer, when you turn on your phone, you open up your laptop, you turn on your tablet, you are you are interfacing with an operating system straight away. It's the first thing you're interacting with. The operating system essentially allows you to interact with the hardware itself. So the hardware can be, you're going to have a network card, you're going to have a storage device, you're going to have something that does compute. You're going to have a, a network interface card that's going to be talked to a network for you, whether it's wireless, whether it's whether it's wired, whether it's Bluetooth, whether it's a radio antenna, it doesn't matter. The, the operating system abstracts all of that away and just gives you a clean application programming interface or an application binary interface, an ABI. And it gives you those things. And then people on top of them then write software that lets you do things like browse the internet. And the browser abstracts away protocols, which, are, which is abstracting away TCP, UDP, IDP through to layer seven, which is then HTTPS, which is then allows you to talk to HTTPS web servers. The operating system comes before any of this stuff. It is the first thing that you need to learn, not programming. You need to understand how an operating system works. So you don't need to be Linus Torvalds. You don't need to go out and write Linux. You don't need to go out and write your own operating system. All you actually need to do is learn how to, first of all, if you're just, if you've got a bit of technical nout about you, you've got a little bit of, a little bit of gray matter in here that's technically orientated, then the first thing you want to do is become switch from the UI straight away over into the terminal. And then we're using the terminal. You want to start exploring what processes are running, understand what a process is, what a thread is, IO, looking at file systems, moving files around and so on and so forth. Then I would say the best way of doing that is actually, so you'll notice that what I've done here is I've said operating systems, then I'm saying you should then jump into fundamentals and then you'd learn these fundamentals. Notice how the operating system is coming afterwards. The idea here is quite simply that these are not really relevant what the operating system is. A process is a process. A thread is a thread. Sure, the operating system itself might handle those things differently. It might schedule processes differently. The it might it might implement memory differently. It might map memory differently, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, it doesn't actually really matter all that much. So what we're saying here is learn these fundamentals, and then my recommendation is you just fire Linux up in a VM because Linux is going to be the operating system you're going to see most in the wild, especially especially in startups and things. And it's going to be just be much easier to do user management, creating, and then a project of creating users. And then we're going to be looking at software, uninstalling and managing software, then services like launching a service, managing services through via system day, via init day, then process management. Of course, how can you do process management if you don't know what a process is, right? And then you've got to evaluate the processes details. So this is all about work, stepping your way through, and then eventually get into things like disk management, attaching and formatting disks file systems, creating file systems, moving files around on file systems, and so on and so forth. So my idea behind what I believe it should look like is we should be looking at operating systems first. The next thing that's very important is before programming is definitely networking. And that's simply because once you understand that a operating system is abstracting away the hardware and allowing you to interface with the hardware through software, you're then very likely going to want to connect to the internet and actually communicate over a network in order to consume remote services. So networking then takes us into things like protocols, which is then TCP, UDP, IP are the pretty much what we do use pretty much daily. BGP that obviously brings us back to the Facebook thing straight off the bat. And then from the from the from the networking perspective, once you understand the basics of these protocols, you can start looking at layer seven protocols. So you can start looking at SSH, HTTPS and DNS. I'm going to continue to add more to this as I feel. I'm pretty confident that right now this is pretty much enough to get most people's most people started. Most people are consuming and writing HTTPS 
APIs on web websites, most of the stuff you're going to do uh, for organizations is essentially probably web-based. That's pretty much what you're going to be doing. So that's why network is important. So you understand how the operating system works, and then you're going to understand how we then network our computers. Let's have a look. That's also good to learn how the hardware works. Learn about OS, so Link, sorry. Oh, actually, I'll go back a little bit, actually, then, because just a few other people said a few things here. Python gets used a lot for Lambdas. Yeah, we read that one. It feels like the combined IT, sysadmin, DevOps, and some basic software development are one roadmap. All are good things I'd recommend learning, even, even for just a DevOps or just a software developer, or for a specifically DevOps roadmap. It's kind of silly. Hmm. Oscar says, is Node.js not used that widely for Lambda functions? I would say, Oscar, that JavaScript is very, very common. So it's very much out there without a doubt. It's very common. You do see it a lot. Is it used in Lambdas? Yeah, I've seen it used in Lambdas. Um, my my um, previous clients have used both Python and JavaScript in Lambdas and, and even Go, actually. So it is out there. It is used. JavaScript is extremely popular, even on the back end. Hey, glad to be here. Just curious, what do you think of the title DevOps Engineer? Just got my first internship with that title, and I don't entirely feel qualified for it. Heard some people hate that phrase. That's from Confused. Well, welcome to the stream, Confused. Um, I'm glad you've you've popped in. It's a good question. So you're basically asking uh, DevOps Engineer, what's that like as a job title? Well, it's difficult because the way I see it is it sort of works as a job title and it sort of doesn't work as a jobs title. If you're going in and you're, let's be honest, like when you go into your DevOps, DevOps stuff and you're probably discovering this already, you're probably, if you think of DevOps as this sort of, we can visualize this actually. If we look at DevOps as this sort of train, this sort of path that you go on within an organization, you sort of have an idea, you sort of then plan around that idea. I'll zoom in on this in a second. And then you sort of uh, write the software, and then you do the and then you do the deployment of it and then you get feedback and then eventually you sort of like loop around right off oh, so well actually you do you do monitoring and then roughly at the top of my head then you get like feedback from the customers and then eventually what you do is you then loop back around to idea and then you go back around through that through that through that journey so that's sort of like the devops journey when you do devops as a, as a job you're pretty much pretty much doing that really that this is this is kind of what you're actually what you're actually going to be doing is is this side of it here this is what this is the devops job this is devops here without a doubt just because uh, it's just it seems to be where devops is what devops actually is is the entire stack I don't know what's happening here, why this isn't letting me just rotate this thing around. Dude, there we go. Get rid of that line. DevOps is, is this entire pipeline, but what tends to actually happen is you only end up doing these, these two things here. This is what you end up doing in a DevOps engineer tile. So when you get that tile, that's what you end up doing mostly. You tend not to sort of, you're not writing the software, you're not generally not planning anything with regards to the actual taking the ideas and turning them ends of actual plans you tend to just be you tend to just be doing the deployment right so this is what's happening and then the software and you might get partially involved here you might get so that's, that's bold and underline this because you might actually get partially involved in the software and you may be involved in implementing the feedback a little bit as well but primarily you're going to be at this sort of over to the right here so when you get a job of sort of like devops engineer this is where you tend to sit it's sort of over on the right hand side of things actually really what if you're going to have a title of a job of devops engineer it should be you should be going in and basically saying okay let's devops engineer your 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 platform then let's actually do let's actually do the whole thing let's actually do the whole thing we're not just doing this we should actually be doing this. So a DevOps engineer technically should actually be going into an organization and working with how are you ideating things? How do you then break that down into OKRs and goals and objectives? And then how do you break it down to plan? Are you doing agile? Or are you then breaking it down into user story, epics, user stories, tasks, subtasks? And then when we look at the software, it's kind of like, okay, well, what's 
tech stack are you using? Is the consistency across the board? How's it going to be architected? What's the database platform? Will it help us grow? Is it easy for us to get a managed service around that so we can take off as much work as possible? Because databases are a hard problem. And then we stand, okay, now let's look at the deployment of it. How are we going to deploy it? How are we going to do CI, CD? How are we going to get observability? How are we going to monitor it? And then, of course, going into feedback then let's get involved with how we get how do we collect feedback google analytics so we use a new relic on the front end on the back end we're we tracing how we're we getting customer feedback as surveys etc to loop back around into ideation to then go back into planning which then feeds into the software which then gets deployed which then gets monitored to be kept up which then gets more feedback and so on and so forth that's really that devops is the whole pipeline it's that entire thing all the way from end to end but the reality of the title and this is what I don't like about the title is that it actually pretty much just ends up being sort of that you sort of get that that's sort of where you end up and you're probably already finding that confused in your job already you're probably finding that you've been tasked with setting up CI CD you're looking at Terraform you're looking at CloudFormation you're looking at something to do with the deployment side of things rather than the actual whole end-to-end pipeline unless you might be really lucky and you might be at an organization that actually does recognize that you're meant to be doing the whole thing and that actually might be what you're getting so i don't disagree with the job title i just disagree with how the job title is implemented so even now my current title uh, my current clients i go in as a devops engineer and i essentially look at how they're ideating and how they're planning and how they're writing the software and i, I make recommendations right across the board right across this entire spectrum here that's on the that's on the screen and but mainly my job day to day is pretty much sort of very squarely very squarely here even to a point sometimes it's just sort of here to be fair if i just bring that down that should correctly okay it goes up it's annoying to put that there um and then that obviously boils down into then you know ci cd it then becomes these uh you know IAC, these are the things that then become my um, become my um, day to day. These are the things that then become my sort of day to day, and so I don't really come over over here that much, and I don't really come over here that much in my experience, which is a shame because it is an opportunity for an organisation to really really nail their processes completely end to end, but it's very rarely done. Dreamcast says before the operating system, also go, go, uh, go OS to learn how the hardware works, the CPU, even possibly. I think that, that we could keep, I think that someone could understand the basics of a CPU, definitely sort of like, you know, it's a compute unit, it has cache inside of it, it's context switching, it time slices, it does things like that, and then it talks to, to RAM and it's, it's got these bottlenecks. But I think because we have access to so much compute power in this day and age, I think we can sort of just abstract away the CPU. But that is that is my view on on that. Uh, the I hope that answered the question confused. Do let me know if you have any further questions or you want further clarity on that. So I got to the security section on the roadmap and then I thought to myself, uh, okay, this is a bit of a tough one. How far do you go with this? And so the fundamentals would be sort of like firewalling, encryption, so on and so forth, I think. Also fundamentals what would be the fundamentals so then you'd be looking at sort of like user management i think that that one here would just be security let's have a look at networking let's have a look at networking and then let's kill that link there and then i wonder if we should go with data and then we look at encryption here these actually should be bigger than that have a look i like to try and keep them all consistent but it's really hard to do data so you've got the security of the network you've got the security of data ultimately if you, if you actually think about the way we develop software solutions these days and the more on the companies that you're working for and so on and so forth really what we actually do is manage data we manage data we move around data and we transmute data that tends to be the primary thing that we do so networking we say you've got firewall it's the primary thing there there might be some other stuff that i'm going to have to think about then we've got data and then i think another big one is going to be this is going to be keeping this looking neat and tidy is probably going to be the main thing that i'm going to have to be <laughs> mostly concerned about um i think password managed secrets management 
it's going to be a big one. Woo! It's going to be a big one. Simply because people aren't very good when it comes to when it comes to passwords. They are so bad at password management in general. And you need multiple passwords as well. I call them human password managers. Oops. And machine secret managers. So like, uh, I guess machine PMs. So the, what I mean by that is you have things like a HashiCorp Vault. And HashiCorp Vault is primarily designed for machines to talk to rather than humans but then you have human password managers for humans to be able to log into their email and obviously things that the humans are primarily interacting with so there's a lot on the security field so this is something we have to be very careful about coming back to if we come down to programming what i'm going to then say here straight off the bat is as we've just discussed would be python and then with regards to actually python itself I think what we can then look at is obviously, you know, the basics of Python. So what does the basics look like? So, you know, obviously is basic stuff, writing scripts, running in the interpreter, variables, functions, classes, modules, just kind of external libraries, things like that, using pip, virtual environments, and so on and so forth. So it can be like, you know, um, I'm just going to put in here sort of like a basic, basic, basics. So like the real basics, as I just described, but I'm also going to put in Virtual EMVs, whoops Daisy. Sorry if you're struggling to be able to see this, by the way. Do let me know if, I'm, if you can't read it on the screen, if I'm, sometimes I forget to shift it all over so that you can see it. So we've got our virtual environments. We've got, a, we've got PIP for package management and stuff like that. So that's definitely one space I would definitely look at with regards to Python. But what I would also say, I would expect most people to be able to do is be able to write an API. Now, it seems a little extreme because in all honesty, it's not something that you do all that often because most of the problems in DevOps have sort of have sort of been solved, really. Like someone's already written an API or a bit of software and maybe it's even a managed service as well. However, I think that you should learn how to write a very simple um, package based on maybe Flask or Django can be very, very powerful. If you need to write a custom tool using something like Django to get as much of the work done for you is, is very, very powerful. But also as well, uh, that's just silly, isn't it? Very silly. But also as well, uh, the consumption of the API as well. So it's also writing. So if I actually move that over, change that to writing, whoops, a daisy. If I can write it, I can't write writing. I'm struggling to write writing. Uh, and then the consumption of writes. So that's, that's actually going like um, the requests library. So that's using Python to then write an, an actual API and then also consume APIs as well. So I think that that's a very, very powerful set of skills to learn. And it's pretty much going to set you up because you're going to have to start looking. You're going to have to hear draw on this networking knowledge here, right? You're going to have to draw on your protocols, your TCP, your UDP, your IP. You have to draw on your understanding of DNS, your HTTPS. You're going to have to draw on your understanding of encryption because you're going to have to understand TLS when you're talking to a HTTPS API and you get a warning back that says this certificate is not valid. What does that mean? Well, you'll understand what it means because we've studied, we've studied the basics. Okay. So that's the idea there. That's, that's the progression that I actually want to see here in this roadmap. And it's sort of the progression I was hoping to see in the other roadmap as well. But alas, they took a different route and that's fine. They took a different route, <laughs> the networking job. Okay, uh, and then cloud computing. Again, for me, look, there's a lot of cloud choices, right? But it's the one you see in the market the most. It's, the, it's got the most market share. It's the one you're gonna more easily find work in. It's just, it's the one that's just gonna be there. It's, there's more certifications are more prevalent. 
the more prolific, I should say, that the more the more highly available, the more, more highly sought after. That's not to say that that Azure isn't a cloud provider people are using, or GCP isn't a cloud provider that people are using. Of course, just have much, much smaller market share. So when you're starting out, because cloud concepts, they do change sort of from platform to platform, but ultimately they sort of still blend into each other enough that if you start with AWS and then you find yourself getting a permanent job somewhere that does Azure, you might actually find, or indeed you will actually find that if you're pretty proficient at AWS and you can prove that, and they use Azure, they'll pretty much take you on board anyway, because they know that if you're provisioned in one cloud, a lot of the knowledge can be can just be transmuted and moved over to the next cloud by just understanding the differences in terminology. But ultimately, it's compute, it's managed networking, software-defined networking, it's the uh, security responsibility model, the operating systems on you, the hardware is on us. It's the call an API and you get a computer call an API and you get a database. It's all pretty much the same thing, really. But I would also always, always suggest starting with the market leader in this case, because you can learn all the fundamentals that you need to learn in order to basically get in the industry. And that's really what this roadmap is about. It's about getting you, it's about getting you into the industry and getting you that job. I need to move these. I'll deal with that later. So you've got, obviously you've got your core services, when it comes to AWS, there's there's quite a bit of them, so I'm not gonna I'm gonna list them all. But you've obviously got your you obviously got your EC2, you've got your RDS, you got your S3. Oops, you got your S3, you got your VPC sort of slash networking. You've got IAM. I'd say Lambda is now probably a core. I would say Lambda is definitely. Definitely a core service now. And so on and so forth. So there's definitely going to be this need to study and understand those core services pretty well. Secondary to that, I would say advanced networking is a good one to grasp after that. Because with advanced networking, you're going to be looking at transit gateways and uh, BBC links and all kinds of stuff. And you're going to find out if you go into an enterprise environment, they're going to they're going to have multiple accounts. They're going to be looking at AWS organizations. That's probably another good fundamental to have in there. AWS orgs definitely a good important one to have in there. But most organizations, large companies that is, are going to be using AWS organizations in order to fragment the structure up. And then they're going to be using things like so. On the second one, I was going to do advanced security, which introduces things like. SCP policies on the on the organization so that they can control what an what an organization a sub organization can do inside of there but also really really sort of advanced uh, I am policies and I am roles and remote role uh, uh, um, assumption so assuming a role in another account so you can do stuff inside of that account and then you disconnect and using uh, trust policies and in order to say that that Lambda can come right across the account boundary, understanding how IAMs are actually evaluated, understanding, understanding the deny, allow, deny evaluation of IAM and things like that. And then with advanced networking, again, you've got things like your transit gateways are pretty much the big one, really. There's lots of advanced networking you're going to see in enterprises as they use a lot of, especially enterprises who most are quite slow to transition up into cloud they're going to want to do a hybrid approach so they're very much going to want to take their on-prem and they're going to want to create a binding a hybrid binding between on-prem and between the cloud and then eventually the on-prem will, will move away and the cloud will grow and then they'll consume more cloud and that'll generally be the way it goes but you're going to be dealing with vpns you'll be dealing with direct connects and things like that so these are all topics that are going to be things that you can learn or you will you will want to learn so with aws there are definitely the core services and the advanced networking and advanced security tracks that i would take in order to get yourself positioned in a job now the thing to remember about this is that this entire roadmap is essentially designed to take the 80 20 approach to the whole learning of your the whole approach to your devops education, your 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 upskilling. And you're taking that 80-20 approach because you want to learn the core 20% that gets you 80% of the knowledge you need to be able to get into the position, to get your foot in the door, 
to land a job and then start gaining that day-to-day hands-on production experience. And I'm highlighting the key things here that will teach you fundamentals and then how to implement those fundamentals, how to consume, implement and consume those fundamentals and how to manage those fundamentals so that you can then go on to learn even more further down the line. But these are the core things that if you focus on them will lead to lead to a job without a doubt. What's next on the agenda here? Well, we've got infrastructure as code. Let's have a look. Look at the fundamentals of operating systems that are just taking up all the space like a big greedy pig. Oh my God. How do I? All right. Come on, Mira. Help me out here. Yeah. Just stretch you out over that. And then Python. Just sort of being there. Let's move that over there a little bit. Just because I want to get into IAC here. And so look, there's lots of options here as well. One of the questions we had about Pulumi on a previous stream was, you know, why not pick Pulumi? Why not look at stuff like Pulumi? Um, actually, let me just stop for a second and come back. I'm just going to come back because there's obviously quite a little bit of chatting here going on. Um, let's have a look. So what do we specifically learn hardware works context? You need to know enough about, so uh, Drinker says, you need to know enough about what is happening at a lower level in order to have insight into strange behavior. Absolutely. That's so true. Like Ninja and I are always talking about how you need to, like when it comes to Kubernetes, if you don't understand the fundamentals and you have a Kubernetes cluster, it can very quickly go wrong if the Kubernetes cluster breaks and a small component breaks. You've got to understand Kubernetes pretty well to, to, to learn how to overcome that. So that's why like Ninja operates on an incredible, incredibly huge scale. If you were to ask Ninja now in the chat, in the questions channel there, you would see that essentially you should always use a managed Kubernetes provider because there is so much work involved with setting up and managing Kubernetes and so much understanding that needs to be done that you just want to abstract as much of that away as possible. So having that deeper understanding is definitely important. Your microphone is really quiet on the stream, is it? No, it was fine. Last time, make sure your volume on your thing is, is up there. Like it's definitely at the lower end. I will I will admit it's definitely at the lower end. I'll bring it closer for you. Is that better, Phil? No, does that sound? Problems, weird bugs, that sort of thing, and can serve at a higher level, same true for networking, yeah. Okay, the computer says, okay, thanks, very helpful. It's a slightly older company. So I got a feeling that these types of processes aren't entirely integrated with their workflows starting in January, so we'll see. Well, congrats on the internship. That's a, that's really, really good news. Let's have a look. Uh, what are, are some most read, most read books covering technical domains within DevOps besides Phoenix Project and DevOps Handbook? Yeah, definitely looking at like the um, SRE Handbook is definitely a good one, which is linked there by Fraud. Google's SRE book for sure. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. Matt James says, I think LDAP APA Kerberos is something worth learning as part of the roadmap. At least enough knowledge of how it works, etc. even though it's usually managed by an IT team after the fact. That's actually a really good point. One of the things that you're definitely going to have to do in the security side of things, especially within um within aws is identity management so that's going to be like ad pretty much most of my clients because they're quite large enterprises they'll use azure ad and then they'll they'll plug aws into that and then the azure ad will also be hooked into the on-prem active directory setup because obviously that's been established over 10 years and so they can't just throw it out the door obviously there's a lot of group policies in there there's a lot of all kinds of duct tape and gaffer tape that's been applied to this to fix that and so they can't just throw out the door so they tend to integrate that with something like azure ad and then they take that as an identity management platform but then plugs into aws and then you authenticate against the azure ad or ad in order to then authenticate against aws so that's definitely that's definitely it yeah i agree with that for the technical side, dataintensive.net is a must read as well. Single best technical to read. Interesting. Okay, I'll copy that and check that out in a, in a bit. Dataintensive.net looks good. Let's have a look. Hmm, YAML and JSON should become those before app be beginners. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So I wonder if then, so programming. So I wonder if it should even come before before Python then. So you think like um, sort of an understanding of data types. So maybe we say then we should be teaching people the data types 
and then it should be like JSON slash YAML. Uh, well, that's more format. So let's go with data types. And then obviously you've got like lists. Uh, you've got dictionaries, lists, etc. And then you've got sort of like data formats as well. Might may, may even need some um, some databases in here as well. It's something I've not had a little think about here. So I was still working on this yesterday. And it was definitely uh, it's definitely a work in progress. That's for sure. But that's a good point. Yeah, I like that because obviously a lot of configuration files are in YAML. The whole of Kubernetes manifests are in are in YAML. Ansible is in YAML. Salt is in YAML. It's a lot of YAML all over the place. And then you've got JSON, which is pretty much the primary data format that's returned by most APIs. You get the occasional bit of XML, but that's um, that's highly unlikely. Uh, I can't hear you, Mike. Um, that's on you, Phil. Sorry, bro. Um, let's have a look. Probably listening on PC and not on phone via YouTube app or inside of Discord. Uh, da, 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 let's have a look. SRE book for O'Reilly and the SRE workbook. Yeah, definitely good choices there, Ninja. I thought most folks were using GraphQL these days. I think I'm a, I've never actually touched GraphQL and I've never seen any organizations that I've worked with using GraphQL, Phil. But I think if you've got a more sort of startup-y, like maybe HashiCorp might use Graph, GraphQL, you'll probably bump into it there. But um, I've never I've never touched it. But I can I can understand what I I've seen it I understand what's happening, but um, I don't actually see it that all that much to be honest with you. Let's have a look. Uh, kind of uh, now I want now I, now I have to learn Kubernetes. Well, tough, Mister Hashicorp. Let's have a look. Da, 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 da. Where if you want to experiment with GraphQL existing app, da, da, da. learning JSON YAML was kind of essential for me understanding stuff. You can't configure stuff till you have the basic understanding. It's very true, Meg. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a very poignant point. That's um, it's definitely going to have to be something that I that I cover without a doubt. Should be pretty simple as well. Let's have a look. The only place I've used GraphQL was when I was working at a GraphQL database company. Well, there you go. Are companies using Fauna DB in production that you know? Uh, I don't think so. Um, Fauna DB. What? I don't think I've even heard of it. The AP, the data API for modern applications. Huh? Is it this one? Is this the one you're referring to there, Oscar? Is that the one? Yeah, that's the one. Okay, Fauna is a flexible, developer-friendly transactional database delivered as a secure and scalable cloud API with native GraphQL. Never again worry about database provisioning, scaling, sharding, replication correctness. I think that this kind of thing would definitely, you would definitely find it. Uh, I mean, in production, I mean, maybe these are a few companies here that are using it in production. I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever seen it. Um, but I definitely agree with this concept, without a doubt, especially in the very, very early ages. Uh, very, very early stages of a company sort of um, transitioning from MVP, sorry, from idea through into MVP and executing. You should be focusing on your data and just getting it stored. That's why I like RDS. That's why I like DynamoDB. You sort of don't really have to think about all of that stuff too much. So a lot of it's taken away from you. I can see someone like this being very powerful. Again, not really played it all that much with GraphQL. Data safety, security, and scalability. You need to build a new business or modernize existing applications. Yeah, so build a new business. That's kind of the key there. I think these uh, these kind of services are definitely aimed at companies that are brand new. They've got an MVP and they want to execute quickly because the the, the point the point the thing is, when a startup has an idea for an application, they found a pain point, they found a problem that they want to solve. It's really really important that you get a really minimal solution in front of customers and get feedback as quickly as possible you want to iterate as quickly as possible that's why that's why agile software development has that sort of concept of the of the two-week sprint because ultimately like you can't really you you can do a few little short sprints and get an idea out but you can't sit there and write software in the waterfall method anymore in this day and age and spend a year implementing a feature to go back to the customer and then they tell you what well, the, the entire market is has now moved on. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't operate in that way anymore. It's completely irrelevant. And so these kind of tools, these kind of services, these definitely help a company get very quickly from idea to MVP to customer to feedback to reiterate to pivot and change and move around. So uh, these kind of things are, are going to be very very important going forward. I think. Uh, 
Excellent. WebDev Junkie in the Super Chat says, we used Dynamo on our Greenfield project. I think it has helped us iterate fast until we went to prod and migrations became a pain. I think so too. One thing I've heard about DynamoDB is also the, the cost as well can get very, very expensive very, very quickly. So I believe that it's not always a good choice when you start provisioning higher read and writes. It can get very, very uh, expensive very, very quickly. So, I mean, in actual fact, we looked at our, uh, Carl and I were looking at our AWS bill uh, just the other day and we were like $7 on DynamoDB and I'd left a table running with like 20 provi provision writers and, and 20 readers. Had hardly any data in it, but it was sat there with high uh, provision throughput. And so that cost us like seven bucks and kind of like, it doesn't even have any data in it. So that was pretty, that was pretty interesting. So it can get, it can get, um, expensive really, really quickly. Uh, MongoDB's marketing team needs to chill. All right, let's have a look. Am I going to get, um, am I going to get Rick rolled here? Link, I'm going to ban you if this is a Rick roll. <laughs> What the hell? What's going on here? Is it like a... Oh no. All right. Give me a second. I think you guys should be able to hear the, the video. Uh... Obviously, when I open. Does that come through on the stream, the audio? It should do. Might be a bit loud. All right. Mongo okay, DB. you know what? NoSQL sucks. SQL sucks. Come on, non serial query language? Can't scale. Okay, you know what? What? It's a duel. Yeah? I'm gonna Here kill you. I'm gonna kill you. Party. Be still. Whoa. All we have to decide is what's right for our data. Be okay. So it's sort of, sort of like gamified the concept of NoSQL versus SQL. Um, build faster with MongoDB Atlas. They've sort of like taken the, the popularity of sort of RPG MMOs, although it's sort of more like, I like the way they've combined multiple, that they've got the live chat that you'd have in an MMO. They've got a mini map, but then they've got the two bars and they've got them side by side, like it's a Tekken Mortal Kombat style game. So it's sort of like they've blended multiple things together. Okay, so far it's about as cheesy as a wheel of brie. Behold, my friends, MongoDB Atlas, a fully realized cloud database that okay. uses JSON, which puts developers in control and speed your time to market. Uh -huh. I bestow on you and the hammer as well. of JSON. Whoa. The sword of denormalization. Yeah, that's cool. I guess we can agree on MongoDB. Looks like my work that's just the developers. is done. That's the developers. They've just got the developers. Do you like having any meat pies? Why, are you low on health? Yeah. Yeah, I have some beef. MongoDB Atlas, the database for modern applications. Is it used very heavily in games, by any chance? Is that maybe why they've done it? No, it's not. Oh. Oh dear. Well, I don't know what to say about that. I'm very disappointed. I'm really tempted to ban you now, Link, just for making me watch that. Yikes. Just kidding. Wouldn't do that. Um, we need a confused Mikey Mo. Oh, I think I've got one actually. Um, I think I've got a Mike annoyed emote. There you go. There's me annoyed. Um, okay. Very interesting. Well, anyway, <laughs> that's a bit cheesy. All right, infrastructure of code. I've only got five minutes left on the stream anyway. So I'm going to continue to progress through this. There's only one answer here. It's, it's Terraform. We're going to zoom in on that just so that you know. There you go. There's the, there's the, there's the, only, the only word that you need to know for today. I want you to, to learn how to spell this. Um, I'd like you to understand that each letter very clearly, which are vowels, which are consonants. Um, learn how to spell this forwards, backwards. Uh, and then also from the middle, left to right, and then from from the middle, then going from right to left, and then reverse the words so you get form terror and understand it really, really well. Then learn Terraform really, really well, and then use it for everything. 
and that's probably the best way to do it. So Link got that as a YouTube ad out of nowhere. Um, I use, I recently purchased YouTube Premium, so it obviously makes me um, a better human being, um, but it also means that my uh, my performance on YouTube is much faster. I don't have to deal with, I can just consume things quicker. I can now consume 755 videos a day, so 500 because of the adverts. Uh, over here, what have we got here? Da, da, da. Dan Manor says, yes, comes through on the stream. Oh yeah, the audio. Oh yeah, the, uh, the video, sorry, great. I recently got three months free YouTube premium because of Nitro. Yeah, I was, I tried to use that and it never worked. So I just, bleh, whatever, just got rid of it. Um, I tried to use it. Every time I did it, it just took me to the standard sign up page. So I don't know. That's okay. I got a month free anyway with the, the normal sign up process. Alrighty then. Well, look, this is what I'm working on at the moment, getting this through. Once this is defined really well, a lot of the streams will then be based on actually teaching these sort of fundamentals whoops today the seating these fundamentals as well as the youtube channel will focus on these and then they'll also all be feeding into the learn devops book over at learn devops.com.au is there another live chat somewhere there is web dev yeah so i stream to youtube and i stream to the discord server as well so if you go to chat.learndevops.com.au you will automatically be forwarded to the discord server and you can join that there you probably get a slightly higher volume um over on the on the on the uh, on the disc you get a better quality stream i think because it's more direct rather than going through youtube which is then probably compressing it but i'm sure youtube live is also is also uh pretty, pretty fairly decent as well uh I, I would anticipate from my phone oh my when you were playing playing back the silly manga db it was the volume i anticipate for my phone i don't know if you have obs up or something to see how many db come yeah so the mic is coming through at about negative 20 which is which is fine. That's really loud at fifty percent on my volume. Um, if you're using headphones, you shouldn't have any issues at all. Uh, pedantic sarcasm. That's what I do best, Meg. It's what I do best. So, sounded fine to me. Yeah, that's what it'll be, Phil. Good, good the screaming kids. Uh, I know I have, but I have screaming kids on my phone. Well, look just sell them all right so then we look at uh, configuration as code we've got orchestration and then we've got ci cd so i think once we get down to here you're sort of getting into that pro oh yeah we've got, to, we've got to do monitoring we've got to do monitoring and then we've got to do orchestration we're starting to look at oh we've got orchestration here sorry ci cd monitoring and then that's sort of like feedback loop because that's the full essentially the end part of the of the devops cycle so Lots to cover, lots to do, lots to see, and so on and so forth. Does anyone have any questions that they would like covering? I can speak into this microphone here and I can answer them for you. Got to DevOps the kids to manage the problem automatically. Well said, Link. Well said. I agree. I think that we should be able to automate our children. I understand um, how difficult children can be because I have a puppy. So uh, exactly the same thing. So on the next stream on Sunday, I reckon um, we'll be looking at cloud news again. The reason I didn't do cloud news today because I don't think much has really changed between Sunday and today. And Hacker News was a bit bare on anything sort of decent. And so was Reddit, really. So Sunday, I'll look at uh, doing some news again. And then we can look at some security breaches, which we can laugh at because we haven't experienced any yet until we are the ones in the news and then we'll stop laughing and we'll look at some security practices and so on and so forth. And we'll look at some new tools as well, which I think will be great. Yeah, the Web3. Oh, what's this now? Oh, the, let's have a look at this map quickly. Announcing the Telfair Distributed Web Gateways Private Beta, unlocking the Web3 metaverse and decentralized finance for everyone. Excellent. I'm really looking forward to the R2 uh, product. I think that that's going to be fantastic. It's going to be really disruptive. Um, please explain this in detail. All right, I'll just do that immediately for you. Before we get any further, brief introduction to blockchain and IPFS. Okay, Web3 setting. You can think of Ethereum as the compute layer, IPFS as the storage layer. Okay. Da -da -da -da. So it's basically smart contracts on top of Web 3.0, uh, fully automated with CI/CD or based on Terraform. 
that's pretty much what this what what web3 is as you can see this this is terraform here um see so it says web3 so it's 3.0 uh it's using x509 certificates to uh, secure the pixels between the their servers and your computer and alice monitors everything for you in order to make sure that the data is encrypted correctly so hopefully matt that's been helpful Hopefully that's exactly what you need. Okay, it has passed my hour. I'm going to have to love you and leave you. Does anyone have anything else that they'd like to discuss? Everything needs to be blockchain, of course. Of course, of course it does. Of course it does. You're welcome, Meg. Thank you. Thank you for showing up. Really appreciate it. Appreciate you all showing up. Some good numbers today. Uh, Alex W, I don't, as I think was in the casual channel yesterday idling and has forgot that he's connected i just dragged him into this channel so he's had quite the experience between web3 and github autopilot we are all doomed decentralized ethereum based memory management my god that'll be so fast we have to play games on that okay thanks for showing up everyone don't forget to check out learndevops.com.au check out chat.learndevops.com.au if you want to connect to the discord if you are watching on youtube after the fact then let me know in the comments what you think of the devops roadmap and what you think of cloudflare web3 gateways thanks for matt to for providing the link all right well have a good day slash night everyone all the best bye very nice